scripture reading for today is from Revelation 1, 9 through 2, 7. If you're using one of the red Bibles from the back of the church, this passage can be found on page 190. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulations and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Padmotus because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the scripture on the Lord's day and heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches of Ephesus, Samirna, Pergamum, Thyreta, Sardis, and to Philadelphia and to Lacedonia. I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me and having turned, I saw the seven golden lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like the son of man clothed in a robe reaching to his feet and girded across his chest with a, with a golden sash. His head and hair were white with white wool, like snow. His eyes were like the flames of fire. His feet were burnished bronze when it, has, when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and of Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and there are things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. To the angels of the church of Ephesus write, the one who beholds the seven stars in his right hands, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have persevered and endured for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove the lampstand out of its place, unless you repent." Yet this you do have, that you have hate the deeds of the Nicolaites, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcame, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. Parents, if you'd like to, this would be the time to dismiss your kids to junior worship. I also want to say uh, thank you and a goodbye to Jonathan Wheeler, who just read scripture for us. Jonathan's been part of our church for the last three years now as part of a, a UNOH, and he's been really involved in Joe's study and been actually served lots of ways behind the scenes here at church. And so, Jonathan, it's been great to be with you. We pray for God's blessing uh, as you move on. We're going to miss you, but we're thankful that we had this uh, season of life to, uh, to have you with us. And brothers and sisters, it's a joy for us uh, to be together to be led in worship, and now to look into God's Word. So let me pray and ask God to speak to us. Great God and King, ruler over the universe, the one who will one day send your Son to return and make all things new, it is with joy that we gather together as your sons and daughters. And today, Lord, we confess that we need you The life that we live here apart from you is just too difficult and it's not worth living. But we get so distracted and we we run after the things of the world. So we need you to again and again renew our minds and refocus our attention. And I pray, Lord, even now today, in these moments we spend together, would you do that for us? Would you, by your spirit, through your words, speak to your people? We might be encouraged and that what you say to us 
builds us up, corrects us, and helps us walk in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what does Jesus Christ think about Grace Community Church? What does he see as our strengths and weaknesses? More important than what you or I think, or what anyone in the Lima community might think about us, is what Jesus thinks about us and what he wants to see in us because he is the Lord of the church. It belongs to him. And so he has the right to evaluate us and also to tell us what he expects from us. Beginning today and for the next six weeks in our study through the book of Revelation, we're going to be considering seven qualities that Jesus is looking for, not just in our church, but in every church that bears his name. In Revelation chapter 1, we saw last week the Apostle John is exiled on the island of Patmos, and he is given an awe-inspiring vision of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the exalted Son of Man, his face is shining like the sun, and he's walking among seven golden lampstands, which he tells John in verse 20, represents seven churches in Asia Minor. And these are churches that Jesus has told John to write to. In verse 11, he says, write to, can you go back to that previous slide? There we go. Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. As we look at a map of those seven churches, where they are in Asia Minor, we note that at least one important church in that region is missing. The church of Colossae is not being addressed. And we said last week that that's because John is using the number seven in a symbolic way. Seven is a symbol of completeness because there are seven days in a week. And so throughout the book of Revelation, we see all these sevens. There are seven seals on the scroll. There are seven trumpets announcing God's judgment. Seven bowls of wrath are poured out on the world. The Holy Spirit is referred to as the seven spirits of God. And in chapters two and three, the apostle John writes to seven churches, not to eight, not to ten but to seven. And that's his way of indicating that what he says applies to all churches. And this idea is supported by a statement that is found in each of the seven letters. In every one of them, Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So even though each letter is addressed to a specific first century church, what Jesus says to that church is relevant to and applicable to all churches, including ours. Theologian John Stott, in his book about the seven churches of Revelation, writes, by praise and censure, by warning and exhortation, Christ reveals what he wants his church to be like in all places and at all times. In each of the letters, the risen Lord lays, lays emphasis, either in rebuke or in commendation, on one particular aspect of an ideal church. Put together, these characteristics constitute seven marks of a true and living church. As we turn our attention this morning to the letter to the church of Ephesus, it's quite obvious that the characteristic that Jesus is laying emphasis on is love. And he does so not by way of commendation, but instead through rebuke. Chapter 2, verse 4, this I have against you. You have left your first love. Even though Jesus is rebuking the church of Ephesus, and he rebukes four of the other six churches as well, we should understand these words as those of correction and not of condemnation. In the last letter that he writes to the church of Laodicea, Jesus says in chapter 3, verse 19, those whom I love, 
I reprove and discipline. So when Jesus rebukes seven, uh, five of the seven churches, when he rebukes us, he is speaking words of rebuke as an expression of his love for his people. Ephesus was a large, prosperous business and cultural center. We can think of it almost like New York City. It was the leading city of Asia Minor, and along with Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch, it was one of the four most influential cities of the Roman Empire. It was the home to a massive temple uh, to the goddess Artemis, or Diana. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And during his third missionary journey, Paul spent three years in Ephesus, and he used that as the base of operation to spread the gospel throughout Asia Minor. Both the city of Ephesus and the church of Ephesus were in many ways quite impressive. But there was one vital quality lacking at the church of Ephesus, and that was love. And regardless of what other strengths a church may have, if it isn't loving, then it isn't healthy. A church that doesn't display love is not a healthy Christ-honoring church. So our topic this morning is love. We're going to be thinking about what Jesus says to the church of Ephesus about love under three main headings. First, alternatives to love. Second, the necessity of love. And finally, the rekindling of love. Based on verses two and three, there are two inadequate alternatives to love. Good deeds and good doctrine. Before rebuking the Ephesians for their lack of love in verse 4, Jesus commends them for their good deeds and their good doctrine. He says, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven lampstands says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and you cannot tolerate evil men. You put them to the test those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you find them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my namesake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have left your first love. Good deeds are a necessary part of a Christian life. They don't save our souls. We don't earn favor with God through our good works. We are saved from our sins by grace alone, through, uh, uh, by faith alone, in Christ alone. However, those who have been saved, those who have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ, who follow him, should be known for good works. This is what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they might see your good deeds and Praise your Father who is in heaven. Concerning the good deeds of the Christians at Ephesus, Jesus ascribes them as both toiling and persevering in those good deeds. Toiling refers to wearisome effort. So when you're toiling, you're not just working, but you're working hard to the point of exhaustion. And This was something the Ephesian Christians were doing, not occasionally, but as a sustained activity. Because even as they faced adversity and resistance, they persevered in working hard. But as commendable as those good deeds were, Jesus still rebukes the Christians at Ephesus because good deeds that don't flow out a heart of love are inadequate in the sight of God. Paul states in 1 Corinthians 13, if I give away all that I have, if I deliver my body up to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. So Paul is describing the most extreme forms of self-sacrifice imaginable. And yet he says, even those good deeds are meaningless if they aren't motivated by love. You think, I give away all my money and that's not enough? Well, think about what a good deed could be motivated by. Good deeds could be motivated by guilt. 
You do something good to make up for something bad that you've done. Have you ever done that? I did that throughout high school, all the time. I remember a bunch of people were picking on this kid. His name was Brad Grimes, picking on him. And I was too, I joined in. And later I felt so guilty that I was nice to him. I sat down for him and had lunch with him. Out of guilt, Just, just out of guilt. So you can do something nice out of guilt. You can do something good to look good. Man, that John, man, he's a nice guy. Or I can do something good to feel good about myself, right? But any of those ways of doing good aren't loving because love is turned outward toward others where by our natural inclination, we are bent inward on ourselves. Love is the commitment, a commitment that looks outward and gladly serves the best interest of others regardless of the cost. That's what should motivate every good deed that is done by a Christian. We shouldn't be motivated by guilt or by self-righteousness. But instead, with an outward look, we commit to gladly serve the best interest of others regardless of the cost. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, let all that you do be done in love. So, If we make a meal for somebody, which I will not make a meal for you, you wouldn't like it, but I'll clean up the dishes. But serving like that in the kitchen, caring for children, teaching Sunday school, going on a missions trip, giving to charity, mentoring a student, any other act of service, of kindness or generosity should always be done in love. And apparently that wasn't happening at the church of Ephesus. And so while they toiled and they persevered in doing good deeds, those good deeds by themselves, without the motivation of love, were judged by Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church, as being inadequate. Another inadequate alternative to love that Jesus mentions in the church of Ephesus was their good doctrine. Verse 2. I know that you put to test, the test, those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you find them to be false. He also says in verse 6, I, uh, you have this, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We don't really know much about the Nicolaitans except they were false teachers. Jesus is going to rebuke the church of Pergamum in uh, verse 15, because there were some in that congregation who had embraced and held to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. But that wasn't the case in Ephesus, because the church there guarded the truth of good doctrine. In his farewell address to the church of Ephesus, to the elders at Ephesus, in Acts chapter 20, Paul warns them that after my departure... Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up from your own number with deviant doctrines to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on your alert. Be on the alert. And evidently, they they took Paul's warning seriously because the Ephesians tested those who claimed to speak for God, for Christ, and didn't. They discerned the false teachers. However, As with their good deeds, their good doctrine didn't come from a heart of love. And therefore, it was inadequate. In the letter that Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, and this would have been probably 30 years or so before the letter in Revelation to the uh, the church of Ephesus, he says that we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, but instead, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, even Christ. So we are to help people understand and grow in their relationship with Christ so they might become mature in the faith. But as we do that, we are to speak the truth in love. So speaking the truth, as vital as that is, isn't enough by itself. It must be spoken in love. Pastor Tim Keller explains why in a book he wrote about marriage. He says, truth without love is harshness. 
It may give us information, but does so in such a way that we cannot really hear it. So what we say to our spouse or to our children or to our brothers and sisters in Christ or even to those outside the church who maybe disagree with us, what we say might be theologically spot on. But if our only goal is to prove our point, we aren't seeking to gladly serve them through our words, then we aren't speaking the truth in love. Maintaining good doctrine, engaging in good deeds are important pursuits for any church. However, regardless of those strengths or any other strengths a church might have, if a church isn't marked by love, then it isn't healthy because love is an absolute necessity of every church that wants to please Christ. And this brings us to the second heading of our study, verses four and five, the necessity of love. After commending the Ephesians in verses 2 and 3, Jesus begins to correct them in the next couple verses, telling them, starting in verse 4, but I have this against you. You have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you've fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent." Based, uh, when we're looking at this word um, first love, grammatically, it could be understood either as foremost in importance, that is the preeminent object of love, or it could be understood as foremost in time, as the initial expression of love. And I think this second meaning makes the best sense because in verse 5, Jesus says, repent and do the deeds you did at first. And this is why if you're following along in the English Standard Version, you'll notice it says, I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. So the vibrant love that the Ephesians had shortly after their conversion had waned. As one theologian, Grant Osborne, puts it in his commentary on Revelation, they had lost the flush of enthusiasm and excitement in their Christian life, and they'd settled into a cold orthodoxy, which I have to say sounds so sad to me, and it sounds like so much of the American church. Yeah, we have right doctrine, but it's just cold orthodoxy. They had abandoned their love, the love they had at first. But was this love for God or love for others? Notice Jesus doesn't say. His criticism isn't, you've left your first love for me or for God the Father, nor does he say you've left your first love for one another. And I think it's because both are included. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment of the law is, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, That's the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, so it belongs together. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus joins together supreme love for God and sacrificial love for others. And the apostle John echoes that idea. 1 John chapter 4, verse 21. This commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love him his brother. After Jesus' death and resurrection, he met with his disciples several times, including one time on the beach, and he had a conversation with the apostle Peter, and he's commissioning Peter to feed his sheep. And in giving that commission, Jesus asks Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? He doesn't ask, will you obey me? Will you do your duty and do what I'm about to command you? Instead, 
Do you love me? Are you looking outside of yourself? Is your, is your allegiance with me such that you'll gladly serve my interests regardless of the cost? And really, that's a question that Jesus asks all of his disciples. Do, do you love me? C.S. Lewis makes a very interesting observation about love and duty in his uh, book, Letters to Children. He writes this. A perfect man would never act from a sense of duty. That's kind of a startling statement when you first read it, but listen to what he says. Because he would always want to do the right thing more than the wrong thing. Duty is only a substitute for love. Like a crutch which is a substitute for a leg. Most of us need a crutch at times, but of course it is idiotic to use a crutch when our own legs can make the journey on their own. There are times when our obedience to Christ is just a matter of duty. I'm doing it because it's the right thing. And it's better to do the right thing for the wrong reason than to do the wrong thing. So, just pure duty, that's okay. But we should understand that's not normal, healthy Christianity. Our goal should be to have an obedient relationship with Christ that is energized by love for Him and not by this grudgingly maintained duty. What would happen if a husband for his anniversary, bought his wife a gift that both surprised her and delighted her. And when she thanked him for it, he said, well, I was just doing my duty. I didn't really want to spend all that money. I wasn't gladly serving your interest when I bought it. I just thought, I should show myself to be a godly husband and get you something nice. That's the wrong answer. That's the wrong... Guys, don't don't ever do that, okay? It's dishonoring to his wife. How much better to say, I bought this gift because I love you. It was my joy to get you something I knew that you would like. And so it is in our relationship with Christ, our service to Him, our obedience to Him should always come as the overflow of our love for Him. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You notice it doesn't go the other way around. You can't say, if you keep my commandments, you love me, right? Because there are people's commandments you keep that you don't love, like police officers, right? Or bosses. You don't necessarily love them, but you do what they say. So keeping someone's commandments doesn't mean you love them, but if you love them, you will, out of love, keep their commandments, do what they ask. And of course, one of Jesus' commandments is that we love each other. A few verses earlier, John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus loved us with sacrificial, self-giving love. He met our needs regardless of the cost to him. And that now becomes the model by which, the example by which we are to love each other. And he says, the impact of that is all men will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. You'll see on the front of our bulletin each week, there's a statement about what we're trying to be as a church. Lynn made reference to this in the announcements We want to be a loving family of redeemed followers of Jesus Christ who represent him in our community and to the world. So we want to be known for love. And this is crucial because, listen to this, if we don't have love for one another and for Christ, then eventually our church will cease to exist. 
That's what Jesus says. That's his solemn warning to the church of Ephesus in verse 5. Remember from where you've fallen, repent and do the deeds of love. You did it first. Or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place. Chapter 1, verse 20, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And Jesus says the church that represents Ephesus is going to get taken away if there's not love. A church can exist without a building. A church can exist without paid staff. Although, thank you very much. I like being a paid staff member of our church. But I don't, we don't need paid staff. We don't need lots of programs. A church can exist without a big budget. A church can exist without air conditioning, although it is wonderful. A church can exist without the latest technology. But a church cannot exist without love because eventually Jesus Christ himself, the Lord of the church, will bring that church to an end. Might be decades, but Jesus says, I'm going to take the lamp stand away if there's no love. Of course, it would never be his desire to do that. And so when love is waning among his people, Jesus not only admonishes them about their loss of love, but he also tells them how to rekindle their love. And that's what we turn to now under the third part of our study, the rekindling of love. And rekindling love requires repentance. This I have against you, you've left your first love, therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you, I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Repentance is an intentional choice to turn away from sin and turn toward God for forgiveness. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Peter tells a crowd who are gathered at the temple, repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins might be wiped away. So the Christian life begins with an act of repentance by turning from sin, turning toward God for forgiveness. That's something you've not done. You're still wondering, what, what does that mean? It, it would be a great joy for me to talk with you some more about that. You, you might have heard it said, well, you, you just have to accept Jesus to be your Savior, which is true. But accepting Christ to be our Savior implies we've turned away from sin and toward Christ. It doesn't mean we never sin again, but it means we don't want to. We've, we've made a, a break with it. But we need to remember that turning from sin and turning toward God for forgiveness isn't a one-time inaugural event for a Christian. Christian life does begin that way, but the Christian life should also have an ongoing display of repentance. Martin Luther ignited the Protestant Reformation when he famously nailed his 95 theses to the door at Wittenberg Castle Church in 1517. And the first of those theses or propositions stated that when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be one of repentance. In Revelation chapter 2, we have an example of how a believer's life should be one of repentance. Because here, Jesus isn't addressing non-Christians. He's talking to Christians and telling them to repent. And the sin he's calling them to repent of is probably not one we give much thought to. Because we tend to focus on the biggies, right? The, the big, noticeable, external sins. He was stealing. He was lying. He was committing adultery. He was drunk. He had an explosion of anger. That, those are the bad ones. So we look at these external sins of commission, things that we actually do. 
Jesus is addressing something much more subtle, a sin of omission, something that we fail to do when we don't love God or love others the way that we should. Whether our sin is one of commission or omission, the proper response is repentance. We turn away from that sin. We turn toward God with the assurance that as Peter says in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, our sins will be wiped away, so we don't have to be condemned by them, but we do turn from them. The book of Common Prayer contains a beautiful expression of confession and repentance in a prayer that goes like this. Most merciful God, we confess that we've sinned against you in thought, in word, in deed, by what we've done, there's a sin of commission. By what we've left undone, sin of omission. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name Amen. Some of us might need to come here today just, just for that prayer. Along with repentance, another step for rekindling love among God's people is to remember their initial expressions of love. Verses 4 and 5 again. This I have against you. You've left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds that you did at first. In Jeremiah chapter 2, the Lord is rebuking the Jewish people for forsaking him. And he says, I remember the loyalty of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Now, what fault did your fathers find in me that they went so far away from me and followed worthless idols. The Lord is reminding his people, he's turning their attention back to the time of the Exodus, where he had rescued them from their slavery in Egypt. He was leading them through the wilderness into the promised land. And at that time, God's people had responded to him with affectionate, devoted love like a new bride has for her husband. And yet by the time of Jeremiah, that love has faded. The situation in Ephesus is similar. They had forgotten about the love they had at first. And so Jesus calls them to remembrance of their earlier love because, and this is so important, because in remembering the love they once had for God, for Christ, for each other, they would also be thinking about what had caused love to well up within them. And what had caused the Ephesians to love God and love each other was that they had experienced God's love for them. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love because He first loved us. This verse is telling us that Love does not originate in the human heart. We don't generate love for others because of our own willpower, because we're just good guys and good gals. No, love is produced in us. It is drawn out of us as we are loved by God. In his book, You Are What You Love, Christian philosopher James Smith says, and I love this phrase, that we are loved into loving. We are loved into loving. He, he just, he's getting that from 1 John 4, 19. We're loved by God into loving Him in return and then loving others. Smith uses the example of a mother who for many days, maybe even many weeks, smiles lovingly into the face of her newborn child until a day finally comes when she receives her child's smile in response to hers. And that's because 
She has awakened love in the heart of her child. And that's what God does for us through Jesus Christ. Because through the sacrificial death of Christ, God has displayed his love for us in the most dramatic way. He first loves us and then we love him in return. Paul says in Romans chapter 5 that God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. The natural condition of every human being is to be an enemy of God. You know why we're God's enemies? Because we want to be God. And so we rebel against his authority because we want to put ourselves in the center of the universe. And that rebellion is called sin. And the consequence of that sin is death, is separation from God. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay that death penalty that we deserve. And in his love, God the Son gladly went to the cross, bearing our sins in his body. So that now, enemies of God can be reconciled to him to the extent that we are actually adopted into his family. So it's not just that he's no longer angry at us because of our sin. He's forgiven us. He says, I want you as my daughter. I want you as my son. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, We are God's dearly loved children. How do you think of yourself? What, what status, what label do you apply to yourself? How about this one? The dearly loved son or the dearly loved daughter of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The loved child of the one who spoke the universe into existence. I like that status. I like that title. And that's what the Bible says is true of me and is true of you if you are in Christ. And it's only by remembering that, it's only by remembering God's love for us and the impact that first had on us when we understood it, that we keep the fire of love burning in our hearts. We are loved into loving. We aren't commanded into loving. Certainly, you can flip through the Bible and see many, many commands that tell us that we should love God and we should love others. But those commands to love are powerless. They can't make us love. They can't even help us love. Only by meditating on and delighting in God's amazing love for us in Christ will our hearts well up with love for him and love for others. A church that doesn't display love is not a healthy, Christ-honoring church. And in order for a church to be loving, its members have to be loving. So brothers and sisters, here we are. This is, this is the application point right here. Reflect on your own life. Think about your relationships with other people in this room. Think about your relationship toward God. Think about how you interact with those outside the church who may be even resistant or hostile to the gospel message and ask yourself, do you have genuine, heartfelt love? Not perfect, but genuine and growing. If you don't, then as your friend, let me urge you to rekindle your love. Rekindle first by repenting of lovelessness. Just calling it sin. 
Don't say, well, I was having a bad day or I was kind of grumpy or that person's annoying. No, just, I, I was sinning. I didn't love. I was sinning. Just, it's much easier if we just call it what it is, right? Because when we call it sin and we repent from it, God forgives us. It gets wiped away. So no condemnation. So we repent and then we remember. Remember the love you first had when you understood just how much God loves you and has lavished his love upon you in Christ. It's only as we are loved by God into loving him and loving others that we will be protected from leaving our first love. Let's pray.